As recipients of God's mercy, Paul addresses practical aspects of God's work in our lives as believers. What does a transformed Christian life look like? This chapter describes it for us. We're continuing our journey through Romans. And so, which chapter are we in? Romans 12. Romans 12, good. So please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. I'll just quickly um, give a, a, a brief of what we've covered so far, and then we'll pick up in Romans chapter 12. We're doing only one chapter today. We're doing only Romans 12, so we'll have the, uh, the time to go through it verse by verse, uh, and, and, and that'll be great. So just a quick review uh, of Paul's letter to, the, to Rome, to the believers at Rome, uh, in chapter 1. Uh, after he, his introduction, Paul uh, talks about the fact that God as creator has revealed himself to us in creation. That none of us are without excuse to say, I didn't know there was a God. Because God has revealed himself to us in creation. The signature of God is all over his creation. And so uh, um, uh, Paul begins with that. And yet he, then he goes on to say that we... As people were so corrupt, so depraved in our mind and our thinking, uh, that in so worshiping the Creator, we were, began to worship His creation. We wandered away from God, and just God gave us up to whatever we wanted to pursue. And that put us all under this whole thing called sin. We all became disobedient to God. Chapter 2, Paul uh, reveals or emphasizes the fact that none of us can keep the law. We don't have the ability to keep the law. Uh, uh, it, all of us fall short of that. And uh, then in chapter 3, he, he finally concludes, Jews and Gentiles have fallen short of God's standards. But, uh, and therefore we are, all, uh, uh, we are all to receive God's judgment on our lives. But, Romans 3.22, he says, God justified us freely through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So he begins to say, hey, God has done an amazing thing. We are all guilty. But through Jesus, he offers us the gift of salvation freely. So he introduces us, us to that in Romans 3, the latter part of Romans 3. Romans 4, the main point Paul emphasizes is that righteousness comes by faith. Just by faith. There's no other way that you and I can be righteous in the eyes of God. It's only received by faith. Romans 5, he talks about what Jesus did for us. And what came in through Adam. Through Adam came sin, death upon all but through Jesus comes abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Therefore, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5. Romans 6. Okay, now that we are righteous, now that we are justified, how do we live this life? Our first problem that we all contend with is sin. How do you overcome sin? So Romans 6, 7, and 8, those three chapters address how as believers we can overcome sin. First basis, Romans 6, is that the cross, at the cross, the power of sin over life, our lives has been broken. So we must know that truth. The power of sin over our lives have been broken. Sin will no longer have dominion over us. Romans 7, but we all still struggle with sin in our flesh. Sin still rules in our flesh. So what do we do? Romans 8, you walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the so that's the thing. So he's, he's really taking us on a spiritual journey. That look, this is how God wants us to live. You walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And of course, there are other things that are, are, are given to us in Romans 8. But last Sunday, we looked at Romans 9, 10, 11, where Paul addresses a, a question in the middle, saying, okay, you're saying all these wonderful things about what God has done for the Gentiles, but what about the Jews? I mean, did he forget his own people in offering salvation to the whole world? So Romans 9, 10, 11, Paul explains to us how God is working with the Jewish people even now when the gospel is being opened out to the entire Gentile world. The essence of what Paul says there is God has not forgotten the Jews. He for a season has opened the door to the Gentiles so that he might gather together all those who have been ordained to be saved. He's going to gather them all in. Then he's going to turn his attention back to the Jewish people and graft them back in. So he's not forgotten about the Jews. And he, he ends up in Romans 11. That God's mercy has been given to Jews and 
Gentiles. It's God's mercy extended. So now we come to Romans 12, where Paul gets back to talking about the life of a believer. And now he's getting down to the day-to-day -day life of believers. Okay? You're saved by grace. The power of sin over our lives is broken. We have peace with God. Wonderful. We are the righteousness of God. Great. But how do you live our daily lives? Romans 12, 1 starts off. Amen? So let's get to that. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren. He's talking to us believers. By the mercies of God. That means, you know, I'm, I'm going to say a hard thing, but I'm doing it with compassion. I'm beseeching you. I'm entreating you with compassion, with the mercies of God. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable See, you present your body. Romans 8, he had concluded what to do with the body. Now he's picking that same thought up and he's taking it forward. In Romans 8, he said, you walk in the spirit. You crucify the sinful deeds of your body. Remember that? Romans 8, 13. Crucify the sinful deeds of your body. Now he's continuing now. Present your body body all of us it's some a choice we make we are believers but he says i want you to present that means you willingly offer your body as a living sacrifice a living sacrifice now a sacrifice when you think of something that is sacrifice of course there is death there is pain there is a finality to it it's over sacrifice but this is a living that means it's alive and it's also dead. It's a living sacrifice. Offer your body every day, day by day, as a living sacrifice. It's alive, but it's still dead. You're dead to sin. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. Holy. That means it's something that's consecrated to God. Holy means to consecrate, to set it apart, to hallow. And Pleasing to God, holy and acceptable. Acceptable there simply means well-pleasing to God. And he says, this is your reasonable service. That word service, they're the same word for worship. It's reasonable, logical, rational. It's not an irrational thing. It's a very logical thing. Offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. This is your logical, rational act of worship to God. So, we worship God in so many ways. We can worship God through our singing. We can worship God through our giving. We can worship God through our dancing, all that. But here's a very important way you and I worship God. By presenting our bodies. As a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to Him. You see, every time, you may not be singing a song, but every time you say, this body is for the Lord's. I sing no to sin. You're worshiping God. It is your act of worship. So you can worship God without a song. I'm not, I'm not against singing. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. You can worship God without a song. How? When you present your body as a living sacrifice. Holy to God. Acceptable to Him. Amen? Every time you say no to sin. You are worshiping God. It's your act of worship to God. So you and I must learn to see your body as something that has been offered to God as a sacrifice. So when sin comes knocking, when temptations pull, you say, this body is a living sacrifice. You need to see your body as something that has been set apart, holy and well-pleasing to God. See your body that way. This body. So let's say this together. This body... Is a living sacrifice. This body is holy. This body is well pleasing to God. It's my act of worship. Amen. When you offer up your body, saying you're worshiping God. Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, 
But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he's writing to us believers. Believers, don't be conformed. Don't pattern yourself. Don't fashion yourself to the ways of this world. But you are watching out to make sure that you don't conform yourself, or you don't follow the fashions of this world, the patterns of this world in a way that dishonors God. Amen? So I'm not saying we, you know, you come with, you know, John the Baptist clothing everywhere. <laughs> and somebody asks you, why are you wearing leather skin and, you know, <laughs> goat's hair? Say, so, oh, the Bible said don't conform yourself. And that's not the point. The Bible is not saying be weird. <laughs> what the Bible is saying is don't conform yourself in such a way that it causes you to live according to the ways of the world. So don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That word transformed is metamorpho. It's the word that was used when Jesus was transfigured. Or in English, we understand metamorphosis, how a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. So don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Have a metamorphosis in your way of life. So somebody comes and says, hey, yesterday you were a caterpillar, today you are a What happens? It is metamorphosis taking place. How? By the renewing of your mind. See, here's where many of us believers fail. We get saved, but our lives are so world-like, just like the world, because we forgot to renew our mind. And how to renew your mind is a process. It takes time that you and I Feed our mind with the word of God. What does it mean to renew our mind? It means to change our way of thinking. That instead of thinking the ways of this world, we start thinking the thoughts and the ways of God. So we know this passage in Isaiah where God says, you know, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. But he says, let the wicked man forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts. The implication is, let go of your ways and your thoughts. Come take on my ways and my thoughts. What will happen when you and I take on God's ways and God's thoughts? Our minds are renewed. And what will happen? A renewed mind results in a transformed life. A metamorphosized life. You're no longer like a caterpillar. You're like that butterfly. But it happens through the renewing of our that's why the word of God is so important. Because as the word of God begins to uh, uh, dominate our mind, our thinking, and we align our thinking according to God's word, our mind are, is being renewed. Someone might, might say, you know, you Christians are brainwashed. Say, yeah, my mind was so dirty, it needed to be washed. You know? <laughs> Thank God it's washed with the right stuff. It's washed with the word of God. My mind is holy. My mind is pure. It's filled with the ways and the thoughts of God. Thank God. I'm happy. Amen? And it changed my life. My way of living has been transformed because my mind has been in you. So that's what Paul is saying. Believers, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what other outcome will be when you renew your mind? He says that you may prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. See, many of us want to know the will of God. What is good? What is acceptable to God? What is perfect in God's eyes? Here's one way. He says, renew your mind. You see, most of us don't like to do that because that's hard work. Instead, we like to do these things. God... If a bird flies from right to left, it means yes. If a bird flies from left to right, it means no. And that's much easier, right? And you look up at the sky, no bird is flying. And you don't know what to do. But Paul said, renew your mind so that you can prove. That word prove is somewhat a scientific word. It's by examination, by testing. Like a laboratory, you test something and then you say, this, um, you know, this substance is such and such. Why? You proved it. You tested it. So he's saying, if you have a renewed mind, you can do the same thing with all the stuff you have around you. You have this information, you have this situation happening, you have this thing, and you look at all of that, and you're able to say, this is the right thing before God. But you need a renewed mind to do that. 
Now some of us are so spiritual, we say don't use your minds. God didn't say that. God said, use your mind, but renew it and then use it. Are you listening? So some of us, we don't use our mind. <laughs> some of us, we use our mind, but it's a carnal mind. So we get into trouble. But God is saying, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to prove. You will be able to examine everything in, that's been presented to you. And you'll be able to test and prove what is good, acceptable, and pleasing or perfect in God's eyes. You'll know the will of God. So one very important way to know the will of God is to have a renewed mind. Because a renewed mind is a mind that thinks according to God's ways and according to God's thoughts. And so no matter what is happening around you, you'll be able to examine, you'll be able to test and say, this is what God wants us to do. Amen? Now, as he continues there, verse 3, and we'll read verses 3, 4, and 5. He says, for I say to the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we are many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So now he says, renew your mind. And as you think, here's how you should think. First of all, he says, think soberly. Now let no man think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Don't have an inflated estimation of yourself that's what he's saying right don't think other the greek says over much don't think of yourself over much may not be good english but don't think of yourself over much don't think of yourself too much don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think think soberly keep your head or say keep your feet on the ground <laughs> keep think soberly right and uh, he says you know and think uh, as god has given you the faith in proportion to the faith God has given you. As God has dealt to each one a measure of. So every believer has been given faith. Think aligned to that. Think in proportion to your faith. And another thing he says is also think in these terms. For he says in verse 4 and 5. Uh, a body has many members. All members have some function. But all members do not have the same function. So think like this. Think as a one body with many members. That's important. That means he's trying now getting into the fact that as a believer, you don't live your life in isolation. You live your life as part of a body. Are you with me? He's, he's approaching the subject. Some of us say, oh, Paul, stay there. Put full stop right there. <laughs> no. As believers, we don't live our lives in isolation. We live as part of a body. So he says, think like that. For we as a body as many members. So we are all members of that one body. Every member has some function. Amen? Every person who is part of this body, you have a function. God has something that he's placed you here for. Now he says, but all members don't have the same function. That means you don't have to try to be like somebody else. You be what God has made you to be. You serve the way God has made you to serve. That's it. But think like this. We are one body with many members. Amen? And that means we learn, to un we understand that we are dependent on each other. We appreciate one another. I can't do what many others are doing. So I appreciate them. Thank God for what they can do. And uh, I do the part that I have to do. Each one of us do, do our part. We are one body. So he says, you think like that. Understand we are all parts of the same body. We, are, we have some function. We are, functions are different. And though we are different, we are all one body. And then as he builds this up, verses 6 to 8. Are you with me still? So as one body, as God's people, we are working, as, we are part of a community, we are part of a body. What, now what? Verses 6 through 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. 
If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith, or ministry that is serving, let us use it in our service. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts, that is, he who encourages in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy or kindness or compassion with cheerfulness. So what he's just saying is that in a body, each one of us has different grace gifts. Different. Or we would call them as believer's gifts or gifts of grace or things, are, things that are our inclinations. Each one of us have different endowments of grace. That word gift there is charisma, gifts of grace. God has graciously endowed each of us differently. The point is, he says, use them. Use them in proportion to your faith. He already told us God has given everyone a measure of faith. So use your gifting in proportion to your faith. Use your gifting in proportion to the grace that has been given to you. So, for example, many of us may have, I'm just saying as an example, the grace gift of teaching. We can all teach the word. But some of us may teach children. Some of us may teach adults. Some of us may teach you. Some of us may teach in the workplace. Some of us may you know, teach in some other context. It's the same kind of grace, but it's being used in different contexts. And there may be grace in our life, maybe to teach 20 people, 30 people. Some of us, the grace of God may be to teach hundreds and thousands. It's okay. There is no competition. Just remember, the more grace you have, the more accountable you have to be. Because to whom much is given, much is also required. God will hold you more responsible. Sometimes it's easier to have little and be happy. <laughs> because to whom much is given, longer accounting. That's, that's the kingdom of God. Anyway, that's a different issue. But the point here is this. All of us have to use it. All of us have some grace. Some of us may have a combination of these multiple graces on our lives. And God wants us to use all of them to serve one another. To serve people. You will see it grow. You will see it expand. So you can grow in grace. You can grow in the measure of faith that's in you. But you start using what you have. Then God will give you increase. Amen? So this is how he's saying as a body, we are one body. God has given all of us different endowments of grace. Whatever it is, use it. Serve people according to your faith that you have right now, according to the measure of grace you walk in right now. So don't be worried. Like, you know, you may be a teacher teaching 20 people and you may have a friend who also is a teacher but teaching 200 people. Don't get jealous of that person. They're just walking in a different measure of grace and faith. And you too can grow there. Nothing is holding you back. Just be faithful in what you're doing right now. Amen? Be faithful in doing what you're doing right now. And God himself, when he sees you faithful in little things, will set you over many things. We can all grow in that. So now, having said all that, he gets into some practical things of how we relate to people. So the rest of Romans 12 actually deals with human relationships. How do you deal with people? And it, the context is as a body of believers, so as a community of believers, how when you interact with people, here's instruction for us. And you can also use this, and there is some of it referencing to people outside uh, the believing community, as we will see. So let's read on Romans 12 verse 9. Are you all with me so far? Verse 9. First thing he says when, it, when he starts talking about relationships is this. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Let love be genuine. Now don't fake it. See? In business world, they say fake it too. But in church, don't. Church, be real. Let love be real. Love genuinely out of your heart. Because people can tell that you're just doing it for show. You're just doing it to impress somebody. So he says, let love be genuine. Let love 
uh, be without hypocrisy. It's not a put on thing. He's generally love people. He care for people. And he says, you hate what is evil. You love what is good. You know, here's a secret to joy. If you and I want to be joyful, this is the key. To hate what is evil, to love what is good. So say that with me. Hate what is evil, love what is good. That's a secret to joy. Because Psalm 45, this is, I'm quoting from the Old Testament, verse 7. It's also referred to for Jesus. He says, you love righteousness, you hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. That is joy. More than all your friends. You want to be happier than all your friends? Yes, maybe. <laughs> Here's a secret. Love, righteousness, hate. You'll be happy. God will anoint you with the oil of gladness. Joy. More than all your friends. Verse 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. So, human relationships. Be genuine in your love. Love what is good. Hate what is evil. Next, he says, be, be kind. Be affectionate to one another with brotherly love. And how does brotherly love express itself? In honor, you give preference to one another. See, back in the good old days, when an elderly person came, the young people used to stand up and give them the chair. Some of us remember. <laughs> Some young people are saying, what were you talking about? <laughs> uh, that's just a simple example where in honor, you give preference. You can have the chair. Why? Because you honor. That is respect. So he's saying now, you treat one another like that. That this is how brotherly love is expressed. That you give honor to the other person. And out of honor, you give preference to them. You let them have it. You let them take it. You let them enjoy it. You give preference. Do you think it's possible or not? And sometimes we get upset. No, why him and not me? Hey, the Bible says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to the other. So don't get upset. In fact, he says this would be something that we do out of spontaneity. That is, you offer it to somebody else. Hey, you can take it. You can have it. Maybe it's a position, a, 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 a position to lead some ministry. Maybe it's an opportunity to serve somebody. Whatever. Give it up. It's okay. That's an expression of brotherly love. Are you with me? So he's talking to us Christians, talking to us to believers. You give honor, preference, give preference to the other person. It's an expression of brotherly love. You don't get upset. Verse 11. I'm skipping some things there. Verse 11. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So he says, when you serve the Lord, serve like this. Don't slack in your diligence. Be fervent in your spirit. Now that diligence, that word diligence, it means both speed and it also has to do with uh, the intensity with which you do. You know, you put your heart into it. So he says, don't lag in your diligence. Don't lag, don't slacken, don't be slothful in how much, with, with, with the, the, and do it wholeheartedly do it with speed. So imagine if our setup team, they all signed up, but they showed up at 9.30. Our service will start only at 11 o'clock. <laughs> but they have to be diligent about what they're doing. Some many of them show up at 6.30 in the morning. They come here at 6.30 in the morning to start the work of setting up or get things going. So we have that kind of people so that we can start the service at 10.30. And he says, don't lag in 
diligence. Don't slacken in that. Be diligent. Be fervent. The word fervent is red hot. I mean, you got fire in your belly. You got fire in your bones when you're serving God. He says, if you want to serve God, do it like this. Amen? How do you serve God? Not lagging in diligence, but being fervent in your spirit. Being red hot on the inside, not outside. Outside, be calm. Stay calm. But your spirit must be full of zeal for God. Now outside, you're just kind, gentle. Inside, you've got fire burning. Be fervent in spirit. Not lagging in diligence. Serving the Lord. This is how we are to serve God. So as a community... We've all been given different gifts, different areas of grace. When you want to exercise those gifts, when you want to do those gifts, do it out of love, hating evil, choosing righteousness, giving preference to one another, but serve with diligence and fervency. Use your gifts with diligence and fervency. Use it. God has given you the grace. God has given you the faith. Start using it. But don't do it half-heartedly and don't do it being lukewarm or cold. No. It's got to be with zeal, with diligence, fervency in the Spirit. Serve the Lord in that way. Verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. So, you know, we will have tribulation. That means difficulties. We'll face difficulties. But in the midst of difficulties, he says, you rejoice with hope. Hope enables you to rejoice. Rejoice in hope. Be patient through your difficulties. And stay firm. Stay continue steadfastly in prayer. So when you're going through some difficulties, rejoice because of hope. Be steadfast in your prayer and be patient. Don't quit. Don't fall back. So sometimes there's difficulties you face as an individual. Sometimes there are difficulties we face as a community together. Or sometimes there are difficulties you may face as a team. That's okay. In your faith, whatever, whatever level this is, remember, you still rejoice because you have hope. What is hope? It's that optimism that you maintain in your mind. Hope is in the mind, faith is in the heart. And you need both. If you, if, you, if you don't have hope, faith can't work. Because faith is a substance of things. Hope is an optimistic view of things. That's hope. It's envisioning what things could look like, even though right now they look very bad. That's hope. You with me? So you have to have hope. And hope can help you rejoice. Be happy. So how can you be happy when things are like this? Well, because I know the way things are are not the way the things they will be. It's going to change. I can see a future that is not here yet. That's hope. And you can rejoice. You can be happy because you have hope. But if you lose hope, you lose your joy. And it also hinders your faith. So rejoice in Hope. So even in the midst of difficulties, maintain your hope. Don't lose hope. See what things could look like. Rejoice. Be patient. Keep praying. Through your difficulties. You with me so far? Verse 13. Distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. So now he's talking about sharing. Give to the needs of people. Be hospitable. Welcoming, loving. Now, I, I think many of us understand the importance of being generous, being kind, giving to people. But don't take it on yourself to be God. Tell your neighbor, you're not God. That means you cannot meet everybody's needs. Only God can. You know, sometimes we come under guilt or sometimes other people put guilt on us <laughs> because we're not meeting their needs. Instead of telling yourself, I'm not God. 
I can help one person, two people, three. But if 25 people come, send them to God. Hey, I can't do it. So yes, we are supposed to care for one another, but understand, do it out of the generosity of your heart. Do it to the extent you can. When you cannot, don't put yourself under condemnation. You're not God. So distribute to the necessity of the saints too, to the extent you can. Be given to hospitality, you know, love people, so on. Now, sometimes people get upset with pastor because they have to make an appointment to see him. The like, pastor is not hospitable. No, please understand. The purpose of making appointments is so that we can all function efficiently. You know, I remember one pastor, we, you know, when we interact with pastors, pastors say different things. One pastor boasted. He said, I tell my congregation, you can come and see me anytime, no appointments. I said, I would never go to see him because if I go at 9 o'clock, I had to wait till 2 o'clock to see him. I'd rather prefer him say, come and meet me at 2 and I'd be there at 11.55, 5 minutes before. See him at 2 and leave. That's much more efficient. Rather than coming and standing in a line from 9 o'clock in the morning to see him at. So while it sounds good, come and see me anytime. You don't need appointment. Practically, it's a waste of so many people's time. Are you in there? So it's not that the pastors at ABC are not hospitable. They're more practical. <laughs> so when they say, make an appointment, come and see us you know, at this day and time, it's to save your time and to save our time. And you know, some days I might see six people, eight people back to back. Well, every person one hour, so back to back and meeting people. Now, I can't expect the person coming at five to come in the morning at nine o'clock and wait till five o'clock. I just say, you meet me at 5. 5 o'clock, come in. And 5.59, amen. <laughs> because 6 o'clock, there's another person waiting. You know, waiting to come. And that's it. But it's, it's to make it efficient. So, don't please, so please don't misunderstand. That was for free, without charge. <laughs> Back to verse 14. <laughs> Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not... Bless those who persecute you. So, you know, as believers, there will be persecution. There will be people who are against us. In your workplace, there may be people who speak against you because you're a believer. Or you say, Sunday, sorry, I can't come to work. Boss says, come to work on Sunday. So, boss, I have to listen to my pastor. Sorry, no, whatever. You say, I have to go to work. I have to, uh, I have to go to worship. Uh, so, please excuse me. Or, you know, different things. You know, they may want you to drink at, uh, at a party. And you say, sorry, I'll have cook. Or I'll have you know, something else. And you don't want to drink. And they, it might become a point which they will criticize you for your faith. So, persecution can come in many different ways. People can be hostile to you just because you bear the name of Jesus. But what does the word of God say? He says, bless those who? People will persecute you. But you bless them. How? How do you bless? Speak. Speak words of blessing. Just pray. God, I bless that person. I know that person is... Uh, it is against me because of my faith, because I love you, because I'm doing what's right, uh, because I love what is good and hate what is evil. That person's against me. But God, I pray you will bless him. Give him peace. Bless his work. Bless him through your prayer. Bless him through your words. Amen? Now, if people persecute you in church, do the same thing. In church. For whatever reason, if people say some things against you, hey, relax. Bless. Speak words of blessing and do not curse. Verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. I've been empathized with people. Get into their world. Get into what they're going through. Rejoice with them. Those who are blessed. Wow, thank God. Now celebrate God's, you know, somebody has received a promotion at work. Somebody has received a raise. Somebody has received a blessing. Be happy. Now sometimes we Christians are very jealous. Right? So somebody else has been blessed. The Bible says rejoice with those who be happy for him or her. That whatever God has done for them, rejoice. Celebrate. 
God has blessed them. God has done a wonderful work for them. God has brought increase in their lives. So rejoice with those who rejoice. But also remember, weep with those who rejoice. So when people are going through difficulties, step in there. Hey, I understand. I I'm with you. God is with you. Speak some words of encouragement. Empathize with them. Get into their situation. Verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. It's very interesting that Paul is repeating this injunction once again. Remember we read it in verse 3. And he's repeating it once again for us in verse 16. Be of the same mind towards one another. Meaning he's saying, I want you to live in harmony. Think together think together live in harmony get along with each other do not set your mind on high things but associate with the humble that means don't be so high-minded that you say sorry i have nothing to do with you you know one thing i want us we must all have we must all have the capacity that we can sit with the very rich and the affluent or we can sit with the very poor and needy and it doesn't matter to us we just look at them as people I can have a meal with them. No problem. Plus, I can sit with people who may be, you know, very successful, very wealthy. Just sit and talk to them. At the end of the day, we're all people. So just don't be so high-minded. But that, that you cannot relate to people who are of a humbler status. But associate with the humble. Are you all with me in verse 16? Associate with the so don't be so high-minded that you cannot associate with people of, who are of uh, a lesser, uh, you know, lesser in, 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 in the things they have. And then he gives us this very important thing. Do not be wise in your own opinion. He said to us earlier, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Saying the same thing now, don't be wise in your own opinion. I like how Galatians says, Galatians 6 verse 3, If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. When anyone, Galatians 6 3, thinks of himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Think about Lucifer. Just a little side trip. Lucifer was the archangel, so perfect, so wonderful, in the very presence of God, in the glory. I mean, there's no sin there. But pride came in. But how did pride come in? Pride is sin. But how did pride come? What caused Lucifer to come into a state of pride? It was self-deception. Deceived himself. Because he thought of himself more highly than he ought to. He said, I will ascend. I will be like the most high. I will take the throne of God. See, as free willed beings, as angels and men are, people are, we are beings who have a free will. We have the freedom to choose and we have the freedom to act. How did Lucifer sin? Who deceived him? He deceived him. How? By thinking that he was something when he was. That desiring for something that was not his. It was God's. I can be like God. Lucifer, you deceived your own self. So self-deception leads us to pride. Pride leads us to our fall. Are you with me? Self-deception is one of the biggest things we all have to be afraid of. More than the devil. More than the... Because even when the devil is not working, you could still deceive your... And you think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Or you think of yourself as being something when you're nothing. When you're not that. 
that is self deception are you with me those are awake say amen <laughs> we're getting ready to finish verse 17 repay no one evil for evil have regard for good things in the sight of all men so when people do evil to you he says as a community as believers don't retaliate with evil repay evil to no one but instead you do what is honorable in the sight of everybody what is the right thing to do in the sight of people do what is honorable people speak bad about you don't speak bad back do what's right bless them or at least keep your mouth quiet do what is honorable in the sight of every one verse 18 if it is possible as much as depends on you live peaceably with all men so we must be people who pursue peace in our relationships so all these verses are dealing with human relationships as a community of believers and as people outside it says as much as is possible in you you live peacefully with every party you try to keep things at peace but it's very interesting he prefixes it with as much as possible because the point is that there are certain things outside your control and mine right there's something we cannot control how other people react so you may do the right thing as a boss for example uh, you may have to let an employee go or you may have to tell a person he or she can't be on your team because the team is being affected now if that person retaliates hey you're doing the right thing as a team leader or a boss or a manager whatever position you did the right thing but you cannot control how that person reacts to this because you're making a decision for the best interest of your team you understand so as much as possible you live peacefully you go and tell the person you know you know uh, uh, this is nothing personal i'm just doing this for the sake of the team i'm doing this for the benefit of the organization i'm doing this for the benefit of the company i'm doing this for such and such reason that that is and you do it lovingly you do it right but you cannot control how they react now that is outside your control so as much as is possible live peaceably with all how somebody reacts is not in your control but you can still reach out say okay you know uh, i still love you take i, I i'm care, care i care about you but don't put yourself under condemnation just because they react in a different way amen and especially when you have to bring correction when you bring correction to people's lives some people receive correction right some people you know, if the pastor takes out the rod, suddenly the believer takes out the gun. It's like, God, since when did believers have guns, you know? <laughs> you gave the shepherd only a rod. <laughs> but that happens. So what do you do as a pastor? Hey, people's reactions are outside your control, right? You have to be, you have to do what you have to do. So as much as possible, depends on you, live peacefully with all men. And then be close, yeah. Verses 19 to 21, he says, now, you see, when, when people don't treat you right, how do you do? How do you handle it? Verses 19 to 21. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with God. So he's saying, look, in human relationships in our interactions if people do something hurtful don't try to avenge yourself don't take revenge yourself don't do it instead let God rest your case with God say God this has happened they have said this I'm leaving my case with you so it says avenge, avenge not yourself but give place to wrath meaning let God step in and carry out his judgment let him decide but instead what you must do is you do good okay? even though that person may have hurt you what should you do you do good he says when you do good it's like heaping coals of fire some people said i just feel like heaping coals of fire <laughs> says, no you do good 
you do good. You still love. You still care. It says it's like heaping coals of fire. Overcome evil with good. Amen? So look at the journey Paul has taken us through. You know, from being sinners condemned in chapter 1 to now telling us this is how we have to live as a community of believers. This is how we relate to one another as people who have been saved by grace, made righteous in his eyes. And this is how we relate to the world. And the world attacks us, persecutes us. Hey, you bless, don't curse. Amen? So I encourage all of us to go back, take some time in Romans 12, and, and, and just pray. Say, God, give us the grace to do these things. I mean, it's not easy. But with God's grace, we can be that community. Amen? Let's rise to our feet, please. I know we're over time. Let's just pray and close. Father, we just thank you for the instruction of your word. And Father, I pray for the empowering of your Holy Spirit upon us as a people, God. That the things we read today, we will actually live. That we will actually put into practice as a church community, God. That we will live these things. That it will not just be scriptures in the Bible, it will be our way of life. Help each of us, God, in our circumstances, in our situations, to do this. And Father, I pray over us as a community. I pray, Lord, over the grace, the gift that you've placed in each person. And I call it out, Lord. I call forth your grace and the gift that you've placed in everyone. That each one of us will begin to serve the Lord diligently and fervently. That we'll begin to move in our areas of grace and gifting and, and be a blessing to one another and to the world around us. Thank you for what you've placed in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's receive the benediction, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit continue always with each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.